the pure, pure definition that's evolved as we've gone around and talked to uh, UNCW and, and uh, UVA, we spent some time with uh, folks at ASU as well, is that the concept is to combine interest in the intelligence of citizens, weak signals in future trends thinking, and mobile technologies to create a network linking neighborhoods and their local government and potentially larger uh, geographic communities and resources. And then secondly, to more powerfully engage the public in quickly identifying changing issues within the neighborhood community, and then last, being able to collaborate with local government in solving issues. So if, if you want to know what mobile, what, what mobile governance is, that's a definition, and we'll talk about the, uh, how uh, the notion is to tap into other networks to solve problems at the local level. We'll get into that, but you can see that it's really uh, uh, assumes and also uh, you know, lays out the philosophy that, that, uh, that mobile governance can help us govern more efficiently in that definition. I want to share this with you. Terry sent this to me, um, <clears throat> I guess probably about six or seven months ago. And this is the cover of a website, and you should take a look at this if you get a chance, but it's, uh, if you put it in, in future Melbourne, uh, you'll be able to get, uh, get some information about what they've done in terms of their community visioning process. And uh, they've actually been recognized because what they did is that they created a wiki page and they were able to reach out to, uh, you know, on the net, and they were actually able to reach out to folks within Melbourne, Australia, but also folks in other, in other regions within Australia that actually, um, you know, visit Melbourne because it's actually a regional hub for commerce and for business and, and uh, you know, medical and research and so forth. But they were able to get um, a total of so 2,500 page views per day over a four week period. And again, the questions that they ask, what kind of future should we have in the future? Uh, what, what should our community look like over the next several years? And they've also gotten, um, I think what's unique in terms of the role of the public is they allow the public to actually edit that document. And so they had about 11,500 edits. And this is really akin to a community plan that we would develop in Catawba County a lot of us in local governments develop plans that uh, prescribe uh, uh, what that community should look like, whether there's zoning changes or planning changes. And I know that we work very closely with the Chamber and Danny, as well as the Land Use Development Board and getting input. But this would be another way for uh, the public to, to have some ownership and be involved in decision making. So that's just the front page of their website. So this doesn't go through a webmaster or anything? It just You just can go in there yourself and... It's actually direct, and, they, and, and what they did is they actually uh, did the traditional role, so they had focus groups, they had public meetings, but they had more participation using this wiki site. And so, again, folks had direct access, okay. and, uh, and at the end of the, the process, there was a way for them to uh, cull through those comments and incorporate the comments that were you know, very uh, relevant to where they were going. Uh, and they also had an oversight board, so they had a number of public members on that board uh, not just government types that help to manage that, that whole process. So again, the thought is is that uh, that there are opportunities for us to do things like this within uh, within our community. I know um, you know you get so many good ideas from uh, folks in the county, including Terry. One of the things that Terry mentioned to me is that with our new library in Shoals Ford, that we're in the process of, of developing plans for, we can get the public involved through Facebook or through, through some other means and telling us uh, what that facility needs to look like, providing their input. So, so, so again, the point here is that uh, if you get a chance to take a look at this, get on their website and take a look. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that there are, are some other countries that are well ahead of us in terms of global governance. And, um, and they feel that that's made them more competitive as well. The four phases of mobile governance are uh, this is a pretty simple process. First thing to do is identify the issues. And again, if you can th think about the uh, definition that we have, these would be local government folks, but also folks that live in neighborhoods, private citizens being involved in identifying issues. The next step is identify key factors and connections. And in that phase, it's very important that uh, folks that are involved have an understanding of what the issues are. And that's also the phase in which any bias is actually minimized. And so just having a frank discussion about priorities, 
uh, the, uh, but you know, I guess the assumptions and identifying key priorities, that really needs to be hashed out within groups to make sure that there's a good understanding because at the next level, they're involved in developing strategies. You know, if, if our, if, if one of the key factors we have is to preserve our water quality and the abundance of water that we have in our county, what strategy should we have in order to meet that goal? Then the last thing, uh, in terms of process, is to vote by mobile technologies. And again, the example in Melbourne was such that folks were able to vote on their, their priorities, and we've got the technology in place to, uh, to make that easier. There's some mechanics involved. Again, the master capacity building and trading that you all have been through, there would be an opportunity for, a, uh, and this is an example of a, uh, in Virginia, in the Virginia area, uh, in terms of Arlington, <coughs> where they develop their neighborhood academies, and that's where folks uh, get traditional skills and get a good understanding of government and so forth. I know in the county and also the city of Hickory, other, other communities, we tend to have uh, you know, evening universities, whether it's a Citizen Academy or a, or a, uh, or a, uh, or City University, those are where folks can learn about government so that when you get involved in making decisions, you get them involved, they've got a, they've got a basis for understanding what the role of government is. So just making sure that uh, there's a formal training process very important. It's also important to identify neighborhoods that are interested in pilot programs. One of the things that will make this process you know, very successful, and we've actually gotten some interest from um, uh, from a couple of places in um, in Virginia, and I have to take a look at my list, but uh, we've also gotten some interest from communities in Oregon as well, and at the end of this process, what we'd like to do uh, in terms of what we've been doing is building awareness, talking to folks, we'd like to be in a position to select three to five pilot communities across the country. And, um, so that they can participate in this process and we would be able to learn from their experience as well. So identifying pilot communities is very important. Offering incentives for mobile devices. And certainly, uh, uh, you know, if we want folks involved, whether it's an Apple or a Motorola, uh, providing uh, some support so that we can purchase mobile devices for folks is gonna be very important. We do know that the technology exists so that people can be involved in line. That was an example <coughs> in Australia as well, but where we do have a uh, technology gap, we'll need some additional support so that maybe non-traditional folks can be involved in this process as well. And again, looking for uh, grants, whether it's an app or, or Motorola, is something that we can do. There's another group that uh, is called, uh, if you go on technology.com, they actually uh, sell uh, polling devices. And so I don't know if you've ever attended a conference where they've got the key, keypad on the back of the chair or on the table, you can vote for your whether you're doing an evaluation or they want some feedback from some of our participants. Uh, that's something that uh, they've got technology where folks can vote online as well. <coughs> and then also we just talked about the 21st Century Academy, just making sure that folks have an understanding of identifying weak signals, uh, they have an a understanding of how to facilitate meetings, uh, and how to think outside of their idea spaces is very important as well, the traditional spaces. We would use some traditional uh, techniques, techniques su such as doing a survey to identify emerging issues. We'd also hold a virtual and real-time Congress, a Citizens Congress, to get input. That's part of the four steps there as well that we had just gone over. You'd be creating the strategy teams, developing strategies, and both to select the strategy. Now the infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that would help Outside of, uh, outside of voting is making sure that folks have access to data. And so, um, and, and, and there are places around the country that have invested a lot in broadband, so I won't say a lot of that, about that, because I know that this group has talked about that as well. But uh, in addition to uh, making sure that folks can vote online and so forth, being able to get access to data that's, that's fairly large files and so forth would help them uh, if we had some broadband. We'd also need a local staff coordinator and neighborhood leaders. And it's very important to uh, actually appoint a staff person to be a liaison, to be a, a liaison and a partner with these, uh, with these community groups. Someone that has credibility with, uh, with the public is very important. But uh, there would be a staff coordinator 
making sure that uh, folks had a place to meet and, uh, and that, uh, uh, that the neighborhood leaders who would be facilitating this process have all the tools that they need to have productive meetings as well. Talk about national capacity building training is going to be very important. Also, interlocking networks, and we've talked about that. We had a fellow come down and talk to this group from Ohio, I believe, you know, earlier this year. And uh, certainly being able to, uh, whether I'm involved in a network of city and county managers and Terry's involved in a network of uh, technology folks, Danny Chamber and so forth, um, you know, filled with the SPTDC, being able to, to tap into those networks to solve common problems is going to be something that uh, would, would help this process. Examples of interlocking networks could be neighborhood academy networks, also neighborhood leader networks, transformational issue networks, and future thinkers, and national networks. This is some recap for you because we talked about master capacity builders, but again, the ability to identify weak signals is going to be a key component of this process. Also, uh, folks that are willing to be deeply collaborative as well. Uh, making sure that, uh, you know, that, that I guess turf is not important in terms of making a contribution, but just making sure that folks are working um, without any hidden agendas, to be quite honest with you. It's going to make this process work. Being able to ask the appropriate questions, and that's something that, um, um, in terms of master capacity building training, is very important. And, and, and again, being able to think differently. One of the challenges that as Rick and I have gone around and talked to folks about this which we don't have to do with this group, of course, is to ask people to, to drop their traditional, you know, filters of looking at the world. And particularly assuming that because I've had these life experiences, they'll equate to this future outcome. We know that's not necessarily the case because of all the change that's going on in our world. So being able to ask appropriate questions uh, to get different perspectives is going to be very important as well. Connecting disparate ideas. Using chaos, complexity, and ecology theory is going to be very important as well. Um, <clears throat> share something else with you too. An interesting, uh, interesting fact here. Uh, when we talk about companies getting back to that list, one of the things that we could focus on, and as master capacity builders in this room, being able to use ecology theory and, and using chaos and so forth. There are, there are actually biotechnology companies and nanotechnology companies such as Cargill Dow that are growing polymers for plastics and corn plants that uh, will be able to, to uh, you know, provide some new tools and some new ideas. And what, there's actually one company through these plastics, they've actually, actually created a coating that will, that will actually allow windows to self-clean. And so if, if I think about my house and the fact that we go through and clean windows every now and then, wouldn't it be nice to have a new technology that allowed us to self-clean? And that whole industry, in 2007, the global market for goods using nanotechnology was $147 billion. And that figure will grow to about $3.1 trillion in 2015. So there are a lot of opportunities there uh, as master capacity builders to identify weak signals, opportunities for developing our economy as well, because there's a lot of, uh, of uh, in terms of the, that, that whole, whole field, there are a lot of opportunities here, just for example. Then being able to think systemically and building treble processes is also, very, is also very important. This is also a, um, I want to make a point that this isn't just a matter of just getting input from the public uh, to, to see how they, how they feel about the, some things. This is really about community transformation. And that's something that Rick has talked a lot about to this group as well. And that's really one of the focuses of the Future Economy Council to transform our community so that we can be uh, in a position to take advantage of opportunities as they come along. And being able to develop those molecular economies that we talked about here, being able to develop a, a community of transformers uh, since we're competing in a global world, and, and also having the skills for transformational learning. And certainly, again, thinking about the traditional filters that we have, we have to drop those <coughs> at times to make sure that we're open to new ideas and concepts that um, uh, may be from somewhere else in the world. 